Good afternoon. Uh, thanks for uh, coming to this event. I would like to thank Luigi for organizing this event. Uh, I want to share a personal experience. Uh, in Los Angeles, I could not attend the event because I had commitment in India. And when Luigi organized this workshop here, I said, of course, I will come. And I was in Moscow in my apartment on Saturday morning. I got up and suddenly I had this dizziness, like vertigo problem, out of blue. So I could not walk straight. And then I started to say, will I miss this event again? So I started to talk to Mario. Please, Mario, help me. Try to fix this thing so that I can come to Milano. So all day long I repeated and I tried also some of those exercises. So I, I am here. So Mario helped me. So uh, I'm uh, very happy to be here and also humbled and honored to be with all these friends and colleagues. But I'm also equally sad that Mario is not with us. So uh, uh, I have known Mario since 35 years, not long like Luigi or uh, Lan, but 35 years are many, many years, right? And we met each other every year two, three times in different parts of the world. And the last one was in Atlanta for Infocom 2018. 17 was it? Right, 17. And they were in Atlanta, and I invited them to my house, Mario and Luigi and some other friends. We had a great time, and after that event, I said we should have a special issue in my journal, Attack Networks, to celebrate his 75th birthday. And Len showed it, and uh, fortunately or unfortunately, it became also uh, for his uh, 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 leaving us. So uh, before I give this presentation, I could talk hours and hours like to others. I have very, very interesting experiences with Mario. So uh, one of them was, I hope you will really like this. So we were in Buzios, north of uh, Rio de Janeiro, in May 2002. It's a nice resort area. So I told him, Mario, I said, let's uh, uh, rent a car and uh, drive around. He said, it's an excellent idea, but you will rent the car and I will rent a bike. <laughs> so I rent the car and then he was behind me. So it was going hill down. There was this gate in the resort. So I passed the gate. The gate was open. And I was seeing him in the back mirror. And he didn't see this gate. So the gate closes. And then I saw that Mario was flying. <laughs> and I thought, my God, he broke something, right? I mean, that's Mario, really. I stopped the car, I got out, and then he said, don't worry, don't worry, everything is fine. So then we drove, and you know, he was behind me. And then uh, we came to an area, he said, Ian, take the bike in the trunk, I will swim around, we'll meet in one and a half hours on the other side. So that's, that was Mario. And then the other one was in uh, 2003, in June, we had an NSF EU meeting in Hanya in Crete. There is this gorge. You go from north to south, like two, three, four hours maybe, hill down. So then we took the boat to come up. He said he will walk back. So uh, before we came, he was already in the hotel and waiting for us for the dinner. So Mario was a, a, a unique person, really. Uh, Mario left uh, a huge impact in the research world, uh, Mario's family. I mean, he produced so many students. He was role model for many young people. He got best paper awards, anything you can imagine. But he was also an excellent person. I mean, you can put a lot of adjectives, the positive ones, like really. I never met anybody who was, who was so positive like Mario. Always uh, open to new ideas. And really, he left a big hole in our hearts. And uh, so having said that, why I chose this topic is Mario was always uh, uh, curious about new ideas. So we have a lot of uh, colleagues, when you present them something, you can see from their faces, oh, no, you know, that will not work. So Mario is always or was always positive. He was always asking questions and talking and, and encouraging. So that's why I selected this. I'm sure some of your faces will say, oh, that's, that will not go through, but Mario will have said, 
Excellent idea, Ian, continue. So, so but we'll talk about 6G, why 6G? You know, when things are clear, like 5G, like five years ago, many things were not clear, but in the meantime, all the objectives are clear, and even some of the operators are trying to uh, uh, deploy these 5G systems by this year even. And so 5G is not you know, interesting in terms of novel research perspective. So now people start talking about 6G, and then I uh, uh, took the uh, liberty to put some objectives for the 6G, what should be the directions. By no means they are carved in the stone. These are you know, my suggestions. There may be many more other clouds or ideas, directions. If you miss some of these things, please accept my apology. So uh, first of all, we are talking about these high frequencies, like 80, 90, and up to terahertz even. And then we talk about very small things, devices, like nano and bio-nano things for health applications. Then we talk about uh, quantum communications. That doesn't mean I do research in all areas, right? So quantum communications will be a very important topic. Holographic communications, like 3D as if they are here. And then, of course, how can we uh, ignore machine learning? But we should really do a different angle machine learning, not these AI type, because some of our young people, AI was a big hype in the 80s and it died down, now it came back again, and they make the same mistakes in my opinion. It's very ad hoc and there's no science behind it. Same thing with machine learning algorithms. There are a lot of uncertainty about the results. So it will be better to understand the brain and then try to mimic the brain functionalities and come out with machine learning algorithms, right? That, of course, it's not easy, but you know, that's the challenge, not writing you know, all these deep learning, neural networks, et cetera. So more and more papers will be out. So it, I'm, I'm not mentioning about those. So then I also put uh, like the internet of space things, like CubeSats, they're up and coming. Many companies are starting you know, uh, uh, explore these uh, very small uh, satellite de devices, which will be in lower orbits. And then you see here uh, uh, 6G radio, I call it. Like the 5G radio is like next, you know, new radio concept, as you know. It's again well understood, and you know they will produce them. So 6G radio is based on some of the ideas which were in, uh, uh, created by DARPA and uh, by Semiconductor Research Corporation, Jump Program, it's called two years ago. So they are interested in reconfigurable front ends, like you know the transceivers and antennas, going from lower frequencies up to terahertz band. So it's a very seamless dynamic spectrum access. And then there is a new initiative going on, it's not known now, from the Department of Defense. Uh, BAA will be leading it, it will be classified partly. So they are interested up to 90 gigahertz exactly doing this, dynamic spectrum access. And then, you know, 5G is based on STN and FE, and it will continue also in 6G, in my opinion. But then there is all these slicing problems, as some of you know, but the automated service decomposition is just missing. So we need much better automated uh, network management system, maybe using some of these new machine learning algorithms you can see. And another thing uh, uh, that's very interesting is Wireless power transfer. Now everybody is doing this research, wireless power transfer even for 5G, but there are some new ideas how we can do much better intelligent way uh, uh, power transfer. Uh, so one idea is floating around, it's called backscatter communications. So having said all of these, it's impossible to talk about all of these in 20 minutes. So uh, how did we come up with these intelligent uh, environments? So I am working on uh, nanoscale machines, and we ended on terahertz band. And then we observed that we have distance problem. As soon as you go beyond one meter, two meters, then forget it. The path loss is impossible. So since 10 years, literally, I've been working to increase the distance. So now uh, we came up with these intelligent environments. So as you see here, in fact, which is good on the one hand, because many of us can get uh, you know, uh, 
uh, funding and PhDs and papers and all that stuff. But on the other hand, enough is enough, right? Wireless communication effects. Like electromagnetic waves undergo multiple uncontrollable alterations as they propagate through a wireless channel or wireless environment. You see here like shadowing, reflection, refraction, scattering, absorption. And then we have interference problems, non-line of sight problems, fading, Doppler effects. So they all affect the wireless communication. That's why we are trying to improve these systems so that we have better high quality wireless communication, right? And also when you go to higher frequencies, as I told you, like for example, millimeter waves, maybe some of you worked on those. We have distance problems in non-line of sight cases. The performance is really not satisfactory, right? Of course, it is worse and worse when you go to very high frequencies. The coverage is a problem. Energy is a problem. It's also one of the objectives for the 5G energy savings by the 90%. And of course, security is always a problem. By the way, I did not mention here, like security, of course, it's you know, by fault. Security is a big problem still. I did not mention there will be a lot of protocols for computer science people, reconfigurable protocol types for the MAC and routing, TCP, et cetera. And then also it will be more and more hop by hop, right? So there may be more under, you know, in the background, but you know, I assume that you understand or you can imagine in your uh, uh, you know, thoughts there are more than just those clouds, right? So there are many solutions and many papers. You know, it's very scary. I, I call it uh, our research world became like Oriental Bazaar, especially the Eastern countries are doing, I'm talking about the Eastern Bloc countries, but like China, they keep writing papers and write, really, we have to change this thing, right? So there are many physical layer solutions like adaptive antennas, MIMOs, massive MIMOs, beam formings, adaptive modulation, dynamic spectrum allocation, many new encoding techniques, and uh, you know, many, many MAC and routing protocols. It's kind of like our daily bread and uh, uh, butter, right? But when you look at the reality, each of these have separate degree of efficiency, right? And still, the channel behavior, wireless channel behavior, uh, 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 affects the performance in the wireless communication. And as I told you, moreover, the distance is a problem. And MIMOs or massive MIMOs may help through these beam formings, but still it's a vitamin, it doesn't solve the problem, right? So, so these are not new. Uh, reflect arrays are here since over 40 years or maybe longer than that. So like kind of like mirrors, right? Reflect arrays, they do not have any processing, just reflect. Mauricio and all these Luigi's and uh, uh, Lance can remember those times. So it was just signals uh, coming in and then they are reflected, right, as you see here. So then there are these relay concepts, right? So relays are also known. So there are like, you know, these relay nodes. And uh, of course, when you do relays, you have these protocol uh, uh, processing, right? So you uh, uh, introduce delays in the protocol processing. You eat more energy. And then I will skip this infrastructure cost because the solution we have, the, it will also have costs, right? So we can remove that. I removed it afterwards, but then it was too late. I already sent the uh, presentation to Luigi before. And then inflexible for existing network layout. So what we try to do is, here, creating these intelligent environments. As you see here, intelligent environments will turn passive, inactive, wireless environments, or you can call them propagation environments, into active participants in wireless signal transmission. Like here you can see, not just reflecting in these reflect arrays, like passive, but they will control the signals where they come from, where they go to. Or they can do polarized reflections, or they can do absorptions. So they, have, they are doing this all seamlessly and, uh, and almost no delay, right? So what is the secret sauce for that? So when you present to the investors, they say, what is the secret sauce? I will try to So we have two tracks for this. One is in the European community. So this is a, a, a FAT project. So mo most of you are from Europe. So here is a good example. You never give up. You uh, get knocked out, you come back. So this was rejected three times. 
And uh, so it was uh, Snow White, and then we changed the name to Wiser Surf, as you see here. So uh, uh, we call this Wiser Surf Programmable Metasurfaces. And the fourth Crete is uh, leading it. And uh, uh, University of Cyprus, UPC Barcelona, Alto, Fraunhofer Institute, and Sigma Generics are parts of the team. So I, w I had a center in Barcelona. Here we go. When money comes in, the best friends become your enemies. So I had to move, because of the bureaucratic reasons, to University of Cyprus. So this is a team of interdisciplinary research. Now we are in an era that truly interdisciplinary research is needed. You cannot say, I'm just doing research. You can say that. But it's better to work like this. We have materials people. We have physics people. We have fabrication people. You have uh, electrical engineers. Computer science is a name that we have 30 people. So then, this is more like the, we, are, we are using metamaterials. And then uh, the wall project is at Georgia Tech, which we are using graphene. I will talk about that. So we are using these two tracks. And we are not competing, by the way, because we are in different uh, uh, frequency bands. Okay? So the first uh, one is, is uh, used by the uh, Wiser Surf. The, uh, if you never heard of the metamaterial, uh, it's a Greek word means beyond, which is a material engineered to have a property that's not found in the nature. So you can manipulate EM waves through the metamaterials, like you can block them, absorb them, enhance them, or uh, bend waves in order to achieve benefits that go beyond what is possible with classical materials. Okay. So these precise shape and geometry size orientation arrangements of the materials that you see here, like meta atoms, for example, that they give them their intelligent properties. So we can also put add on top of these uh, intelligent properties of the metamaterials, also those algorithms. You make it double or triple the intelligent, right? So now you can see here the metamaterials. We can do all these uh, signal. Uh, 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 manipulations like steering, absorbing, absorbing, polarizing, all of these. Okay. So now, uh, uh, again, you know, I can tell you all the details, but just the basic ideas. As you see here, we have these two papers in Archival Communication Magazine and Communication of the ACM. We also applied for patents. So now you see here, we have these three layers. That's the tile, you can call it, right? These are the meta surfaces. And these are the, as you see here, meta atoms, metallic patches, or we also call them unit cells. And so that's the uh, lowest layer. Then we have switch configuration, which is because we are talking about programmable, the programmer can customize, deploy, or retract functionalities on demand via access points with appropriate callbacks. And then we have this electromagnetic function, which supports, again, software description or meta surface electromagnetic functions, like you know, absorb direction, et cetera. And then we also go with the 5G using controllers, right? Again, I hope you know uh, 5G architectures. Like, like these controllers will be controlling these uh, tiles. And then you know, first we are looking for the indoor cases, but uh, it should also be applicable to the outdoor cases, right? So now uh, when you have something the transmitter is here, receiver is you know, in another build, you know, another room, another area, floor. So you can have these tiles. Again, there's a question mark. We're working on it. Like topology control, optimized the number of these patches or these tiles. And then the routing problem, you can imagine, right? When you do signaling, what is the best path to go from one end through all these uh, uh, tiles to the end? So there are many, many open questions. So that's why we have 30 people that they're working on. And uh, so now you can see there are many use cases that you can do with all this control signaling. For example, if you have a user A that it needs the maximum QoS, you can do beam formings to maximize the QoS requirements of this user. Or if there is an eavesdropper, for example, on unauthorized user, you can block that the signals will not go to him if you have a you know, uh, broadcast environment. Or uh, like all this wireless power transfer, secure air pass, avoid use drops, uh, drops, dro uh, droppings. So you can do all these controls of the signals and the beam forms where they should go. Okay. So 
we have actually two years into the, system, uh, into the project. We have two more years to go. So we have the first prototype uh, produced by the Fraunhofer Institute in Berlin. You see here this uh, you know, size. This needs to be still optimized, right? Plus the costs are high. So that's another objective for the optimization, minimizing the costs, right? So it's very interesting that we will continue to work on this. There's a lot of uh, you know, problems that you can imagine. So the second track is, again, this is based on uh, 12 years of work. So this is uh, uh, the ultramassive MIMO that we developed in my lab. So this is the graphene level. And graphene is sitting on top of the dielectric material. And then you can see we have the wavelengths uh, divided by two. We are using surface plasma and polariton waves from physics. And believe it or not, we have 1024 by 1024 antenna elements. You know, you can, we, that's why we call it ultramassive MIMO. And uh, the side is very area. And we have a pattern for it, uh, 2017. So the single antenna case was locked by the CIA. It took us four years to get the release. And then finally, we got the patent in 2017 also. You can see here, again, uh, graphene uh, put on top of the dielectric material. And then the electromagnetic waves come in. Service plasma polarity move, move, move. And then uh, you know, uh, the antenna works like nanoscale antenna. And this goes also with each of these elements is represented by this one. So as a result, we have also this front end, which we are also trying to do the 6G radio, by the way, like uh, dynamic uh, spectrum access. So we have the antenna and the transceiver. We also have, sorry about the formatting here, another patent for it. So we have a complete front end all uh, on the graphene base. The disadvantage of this technology is graphene is working very well on the higher frequencies. But when you go down to 160 gigahertz, then we have to go other materials like metamaterials. That's why we use the uh, first tile design. Okay? So we have also these uh, design ideas about, uh, you know, we call this plasmonic layers, the control layer, and a wave guiding layer. So we can do all of this automatically about the uh, signal manipulations through these walls. Okay. So you see here uh, another nice picture with all these you know, ultramassive MIMO platforms, tiles. And we will put them here in these environments. Of course, again, the question is, what should be the optimum number of these tiles, et cetera, et cetera. So there are many, many open questions. By it. it will take us five more years to, to you know, answer many, many questions. So now, what are the nice things about these new tiles? We can do dynamic massive MIMO, like we can do different uh, beam forms, whatever they want. Certain elements can do certain beam forms, or they all work together. They can do razor sharp beam forming. And then another thing here called multi band massive MIMO. So we can have. And uh, so then we can do beam forming using through these multi bands. So I just put there like little. Uh, uh, a set of questions, but there are, uh, you know, we can multiply it with a large number of uh, uh, challenges that they are still open. So, the good news is, now a lot of people jumped on this. That's typical, right? So, uh, good or bad? Good is that we can get references. The bad is, again, they do the same mistake. They're interested in just writing papers. So, when you see these papers, Okay, all of these, some of them are in China. So they're always thinking it's reflect array. So they are communication theory people. All they do is a signal comes in and goes, and what is the end-to-end -end delay, blah, blah, blah. So I'm telling them, in fact, I was in ICASP like a couple weeks ago in Brighton. So there was this guy from Singapore. He did the same. I said, look, you don't have solved the problem. I mean, well, he said, I have triple the transactions papers. But that's not the point, right? So uh, the, the issue is the following. If you want to try to get into this area, please try to find you know, uh, materials people, physics, and all these things as I was explaining to you. Make assumptions, because the heart, the core of the problem is in this tile design, not the signal coming and leaving. So really. So, uh, so I hope that we'll get more and more people like you know, we try to do those. 
and uh, so that we can you know, push the technology forward. So here are these papers that are uh, appearing in this list. So I thank you for listening to me.